Luke, the 22nd chapter, verses number 31 through verse number 34. I'm going to read more from Luke, the 22nd chapter, but I'll read it after we have prayed and after you have been seated. I shall only ask you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word for these few verses. Luke 21, excuse me, 22, verses 31 through 34. And the King James text today reads, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, that is Simon Peter, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. And he, meaning Jesus, said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day, before thou shalt, thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Amen. Luke 22, 31 through 34. Once again, if you bow your heads, Father, the moment in this service has come when the Word of God must go forth. Lord, I grew up in a Holy Ghost-filled church. I, I grew up in an old-fashioned Pentecostal church with a good old-fashioned Pentecostal preacher and good old-fashioned Pentecostal altars. And Father, if there is any truth that I am aware of, it is that the pulpit is a sacred obligation. It is more than merely a piece of furniture. It is, in fact, the sacred disk. This is that place from which sacred business is done. Holy business is done. This is that disk from which the Word of God is disseminated for the benefit of your people. Master, today we need to hear from heaven. We live in an hour, God, when there is a feast, excuse me, a famine in the land. There is indeed today, God, a thirst for water. It is not a thirst for literal water, neither is it a famine for literal food, but it is a thirsting and a famine for the hearing of the Word of God. So many in the church world today are hearing sermons preached from the Bible, but they do not originate from the throne room of grace. Lord, I seek you for every word that I deliver to your people, and this today is a powerful, important word that you've placed in my spirit to deliver unto the people of God, those under the sound of my voice, those in this sanctuary today, those who are watching by reason of the Internet. I pray that your divine anointing would rest upon me. Let me speak with divine authority. Let me speak in love, O oh God. Let me declare plainly the truth of God that is able to set men free, that is able to deliver and heal, that is able, God, to bring salvation to the lost and to restore those who are backslidden. Anoint not only my feeble lips, but also anoint the ear of every hearer, that their heart might be prepared this hour to receive that which the Holy Ghost would speak unto the church. We ask it in none other than Jesus' glorious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Now I have read to you just a few verses today from the 22nd chapter of the book of Luke. And in these few verses, we see Simon Peter declaring his undeniable
undying devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we see the Lord prophetically declaring to Peter that the enemy of his soul has desired to have him. I will tell you something, the closer you get to God, the more the devil wants you on this payroll. The closer you get to the kingdom of heaven, the closer you get to the heart of God and the mind of God, let me tell you, the more the enemy will be after your soul. Don't think for a moment that walking close to God is going to make your life easier. No, the closer you walk to God, the harder things become. Yea, and all they who will live godly in Christ Jesus, the word of God declares, shall suffer persecution. It's just part of the package. It's part of what happens. He said, Satan has desired to sift you as weak. What does that mean? It means Satan's desire to put you through the ringer so that your real metal can be tested. He wants to do things with you so that you can really reveal what is true and what is not true. See, a lot of people, Lisa, they, they go through their walk with God and they put up this pretense in front of people and they put up this little act in front of people. But when real life comes in, when real circumstances come along, all of a sudden they are sifted. All of a sudden the wheat is separated from the chaff, and all of a sudden they stand before you naked without a fig leaf, and you know exactly what they are. You know exactly what they look like. And their faith wasn't near what they claimed it to be. Their faith wasn't anything like what they represented it to be. And then the Lord prophetically indicates that Peter will fail. It's going to happen. I got news for you today, folks. There are going to be times that you fail. There are going to be days when you slip. There are going to be days and hours and times in your life when you say things you ought not to have said. There are going to be those moments when you do things you ought not to have done. There are going to be times when you go into places you should not to have gone into. There are going to be moments of weakness. There are going to be moments when your faith is tested and tried. And quite frankly, you will get an F on the test. The title of my message today, How to Handle Failure. He said, but when you are converted, when you've made your way back to victory, hallelujah, you see, failure is not the end all and the be all. What determines the end is how the story ends. Amen? Right. You see, Tommy, it don't matter what the middle of the story is. It don't matter what the start of the story is. Somebody can start out dirt poor. Somebody can start out broke, and they can start out in the gutter. They can start out life with an alcoholic daddy and a drug addict mommy, and yet the beginning of the their story doesn't mean a lot because what's far more important than the beginning, what's far more important than the middle is the end. What happens when all that other is finished and done? What happens when our life circumstances and the situations we could not control in our life have drifted back into history and they've become part of our past but not part of our present? What happens when we have failed yesterday? What did we do today? Did we wallow in our failure? Did we continue to walk in our failure? Or did we shake the dust off our clothes and say, Bless God, I really messed up yesterday. But hallelujah, I'm going to walk in victory today. Glory to right. God. I'm going to get back to where I need to be. I remember when I first came back to the church after being out for a few years, I've told you the story, after I made my way out of a very dark place. 
back in 1989. I was out of the church for a few years, and when I made my way back, I made my way back, and oh, I had so many. My God, I had a laundry list of ugly things behind me. I had a history of three or four years of some terrible, terrible acts. Talk about going places I shouldn't have been. Oh, my goodness. I couldn't list the number of places I went that I shouldn't have been at. Talk about being with people I shouldn't have been hanging with. Talk about doing things, dear Jesus, I shouldn't have been doing. Saying things that should mind, my, 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 my. I was saying things that should have been saying every day I was out of the church. But when I came back, I said, Lord, I can't wallow in the failures of my past. I cannot sit here and just allow my soul to marinate in the failures of my past. I've got to rise up out of this cesspool. I've got to make my way onto land. Hallelujah. I've got to crawl out of the pond and get myself on higher ground. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not going to tell you it was a thing I could do in one day. No, it was not. I'm still climbing. I still hadn't reached the top of the mountain, but I'll tell you what, I'm a whole lot closer than I was yesterday. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. I'm just about ready to pitch my flag and declare that I am where I should be. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I've been working on it for a long time. It's hard when you backslide. It's hard when you fall out of the way. It's hard when you fail God in such a way that it brings such shame and dishonor to your testimony and it soils your spirit and it robs you of your joy. Peter experienced this. We read also in Luke chapter 22. Listen now, this is the rest of that story that we started reading today. Jesus now is being brought to be judged and sentenced and crucified. And the Word of God declares in verse 54 through verse 62, Then took they him, Jesus, and led him and brought him into the high priest's house. And Peter followed afar off. Mm, he was already starting to slip away. He already was trying to keep his distance. How many Christians today have already decided, I'm not going to tell anybody I'm a Christian. I'm not going to mention to anybody that I'm a child of God. I'll just keep that to myself. I'll just keep that private. Remember what I talked about last week? That you can't live your Christian life in the closet. You cannot live your Christian life privately. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them, but a certain maid behind him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a little while, another saw him and said, Thou art also of them, meaning a disciple of Christ. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after another confidently affirmed saying, Of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he yet spake, the cock crew. Mm -hmm. And the Lord turned. Oh, my God. Oh, this experience might not have been quite so bad had Jesus not turned and looked upon Peter. Here Peter is on the outside looking in. Jesus is standing before the high priest. All of a sudden the cock crows and Jesus turns his head and he looks through the gate and his eyes meet Peter's. 
and exactly what God had told him was going to happen, happened. And here now we have the rooster crowing. And Jesus is looking at Peter. Oh, I can't even imagine how bad Peter must have felt. Mm -mm. Oh, Lord, please don't look at me. Whatever you do. Can you imagine Peter turning his head to break eye contact? Lord, please, Jesus, don't look at me. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter, remembering the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Oh my. I dare say we've all failed at times. And the failure has been of such a magnitude that we find ourselves somewhere alone weeping bitterly. Maybe I'm the only one in the room who's ever failed God in such a way. Nope. Maybe I'm the only one in the room who's ever failed my partner or my, not my spouse, because I never had been married before, but, you know, in a relationship. Maybe I'm the only one that's ever done something in a relationship I ought not to have done that ultimately led me to tears that were bitter. Tears that burned my eyes as they rolled down my cheeks because I was so ashamed and so embarrassed by that which I had done. We have all at various times experienced failure. We have made verbal claims or we have expressed promises that we could not back up. Lisa, there are times I've bitten off more than I can chew. I don't know if you've done that or not. But failure is like a malfunctioning explosive device. If we do not handle it properly, it will destroy us. My Lord have mercy. A soldier holding a rifle that is not working as it is designed to work is going to find himself being sent home in a flag-draped coffin. Unless he lets go of the malfunctioning weapon and grabs hold of another that works as it should. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? If something's not working, if something is failing, then you let go of it. Hallelujah! And grab hold of something that works. Glory to God. Otherwise, you will assure your own destruction. You can't afford to hold on to something that is malfunctioning. Too many people hold tight to that which does not work, hoping it will suddenly leap into action and succeed. Oh my goodness, how many of us have been there with relationships? How many of us have been there with marriages? How many of us have been there with jobs? It isn't working. Things aren't going well. Everything's falling apart. But my God, we just hang in there and we stay with it, hoping that by some miracle, all of a sudden, everything's going to jump into place. And it's going to work like it should. I've been in relationships I had no business being in. I've been devoted and committed to people that didn't love me, didn't care about me, were out there doing all kinds of things behind my back and doing me dirty. And Lisa, I clung to that person like my life depended on it, hoping and praying at some moment they would suddenly grow a conscience. <sighs> And all of a sudden, our relationship would fall into place and everything would go the way that a relationship ought to go. I've got news for you. It doesn't work that way. At some point, we must be reasonable. We must be realistic. We have to realize that if it did not work yesterday and it is not working today, you can bank on the fact it will not work tomorrow. The best plan of action is to let go of the failure and move ahead. Hallelujah. Failure today does not guarantee failure tomorrow. Unless, of course, we insist upon carrying our failure into the future. 
rather than allowing it to fall upon the trash heap of history. Peter would never have become the rock that Jesus said Peter would become. He would never have become the pillar of the faith that he became. He would never have become one of the 12 apostles whose name will one day be etched into the foundation, or excuse me, the, uh, the gates of the holy city. But his name will be there. I'll tell you something, he became something wonderful. He became something powerful. He became something very successful. But he would never have become that apostle. He would never have become that rock Jesus said he would become had he continued to hold fast to the failures of his past. That's right. Mm. Mm -hmm. See, a lot of people don't realize just how big a failure Peter really was. <laughs> In Matthew 7, verse 17, verse 4, we read about what is referred often to the transfiguration of Christ. Do you remember that? How that the Lord took Peter, James, and John up into the mountain to pray with him. And as the Lord was praying there, all of a sudden, there appeared Moses and there appeared Elijah, a representative of the law and a representative of the prophets. And Jesus said, I have not come to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. And here he is now, glorified. He is shining like the sun. His deity revealed. It's been laid open before Peter, James, and John. Oh my goodness, look at what they're seeing! This is no ordinary man. Ooh, this Jesus, we've been following. There's something different about him. He's got a couple men, one that was transported to glory without the benefit of death, and the other who we know has been dead for thousands of years. And yet they stand before us right now with Jesus. <laughs> My goodness. Can you imagine what Peter must have said? Oh, can you imagine, Peter? Said, oh, Lord, thank you for allowing us to be here for this incredible event. Thank you, God, for allowing us to see with our own eyes just who you are and what your divine nature within truly is. Thank you for allowing us to see. Is that what Peter said? No. Listen. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Well, they started out okay. <laughs> if thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. Oh, my God, have mercy. You idiot. You want to build three churches. You want to build one to Jesus, one to Moses, and one to Elijah. My God, have mercy. The Lord has just revealed his deity to you. As a Jew, you know that you're to worship no man. You're to worship no one but God alone. And here you are ready to build three tabernacles, two to mere men and one to the God-man Jesus. Mm -hmm. How foolish could you be? See, I told you, Peter's failed a whole lot more than you realize Peter failed. <laughs> My Lord, have mercy. Peter failed to understand that the law and the prophets cannot be exalted to a place that makes them equal to Christ. In the end, when the smoke has cleared and the glory has faded, all that remains, the Word of God said, was Jesus only. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lisa. The law can't help us. The prophets can't help us. Jesus alone is the answer. Jesus alone is the way. Hallelujah! Yeah. We read in Matthew 14, verses 28 through 31, of Peter's attempt at walking on the water. 
as they see Jesus walking toward the boat. And the word of God declares, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come out unto thee on the water. And he, meaning Jesus, said, Come! And when Peter was come out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Woo! There's a vision of victory. Boy, there's a vision of faith proving that faith works. Hallelujah. There, now we have a vision. When God speaks, if we'll obey his word, we're guaranteed success. Hallelujah. But look at the word that begins verse 30. But, hmm, I've told you in the past, there is no bigger word in the Bible than but. But when he, Peter, saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him. Now look at this. Jesus is stretching forth his hand. Peter's reaching up as he's sinking into the water. They grab hold of hands. The Lord is pulling them upward. And as he does so, the Lord is speaking. And what does he say to Peter? My Peter, your faith is great. You were the only one on that boat who knew that if I spoke the word, you too could walk on the water. No. Is that what he said? No, it's not what he said. <laughs> Said, and immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, while they're still in the water, Lisa, mm -hmm. O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? My God have mercy. What a failure. What an embarrassment. I'm the only one in the boat that had the faith to believe that if the Lord spoke, I could do whatever he told me to do. I got out on the water, and then what I do? I made a big donkey out of myself. I made a big fool out of myself. My faith failed me in front of the other disciples, and now I'll never live this down. They'll be chiding me and teasing me and reminding me of this failure for decades to come. The Lord questioned Peter's lack of faith while they were both yet on the water before even stepping back into the boat. What an embarrassment. What a humiliation. What a miserable, embarrassing failure. Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 33, we read of Peter as he fails to understand the need for the cross. Mark 8, 31 through 33. And he, Jesus, began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he spake that saying openly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, so Peter takes the Lord aside says, Lord, don't even say these kind of things. Why are you telling us these horrible things? Don't even say this, that this is necessary. And the Lord turns, he looks at the other disciples. He's thinking, I better address this. Because if I don't, those fellows are going to have the wrong idea about things. They're not going to understand how this works. The word of God says... When he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. See, men don't like pain. 
Men don't like struggle. Men don't like judgment. Men don't like condemnation. Men most certainly don't like death. Peter, don't you get it? I told you about all the bad stuff that's going to happen, but I also told you the story ain't going to end that way, that there's going to be a resurrection. I told you it was going to be tough on Thursday and Friday, but I also told you Sunday was coming. Hallelujah to God. I told you the whole story, and you still have the gall to rebuke me. You still cannot see the need for the cross. I'm here to tell you today, folks, in many ways, Peter seemed to be the worst of the Lord's students. He often failed to grasp the truth or the spiritual lessons that were presented to him. But his future would prove to be far brighter than his days in Bible college. He would one day become the primary figure in the daily life of the church. And he would become the foremost preacher of the gospel, opening the door to God's kingdom for every community and every nationality on earth. Hallelujah to God. The Lord said, your name is Cephas. It means a stone. But I tell you, that upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I shall give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Said Peter, you got one thing right. You finally understood that I am the Christ, the son of the living God, that I am a human being who fulfills the promise of God for a Messiah, but that at the same time I'm the son of God. I am a man who, who is literally God in human form. You, you've made that declaration, Peter, and for that declaration I reward you. I tell you that while your name suggests you're a stone, I'm telling you you're far more than a stone stone. You're a rock. And upon this rock, yes, God used men to lay as the foundation of his church. The word of God tells us that the church of Jesus Christ is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So, yes, when, God, when the Lord said to Peter that upon this rock, yes, he was talking about Peter. He was not talking about the so-called profession. You see, that's how a lot of theologians try to twist it around. No, no. The Lord, clearly the Word of God teaches us that the apostles were in fact the material from which God laid the foundation of the church. And the Lord said, Peter, you're not just a pebble. You're not just a stone. You're a rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And then he goes on to say, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, Peter does not stand, as you see in cartoons and as you see in comic strips, at the gate of heaven deciding who gets in and who doesn't. No, that's not his job. But his job was to preach for the very first time to every nationality on earth. It was him, it was Peter, who opened the door of the gospel in the book of Acts in Jerusalem. Jesus said in Acts 1 and 8, But thou shalt receive power. You shall be endued with power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Peter preached the gospel to the Jews who were present as well as all the others who had come from various parts of the world to celebrate Pentecost on the day of Pentecost. He opened the door to the Samaritans. Didn't the Lord say unto Samaria? He said, he said, you should receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost come upon you, you should be witness unto me in Jerusalem and in all Judea, meaning all the rest of the Jewish world. Well, Peter is the one who opened the door to the kingdom of God for Judea, the Jewish people, all of the Jewish territory, which was occupied by Romans at that time. Remember a little meeting Peter was invited to go to at the house of a Roman soldier? Peter opened the door to all Judea. Hallelujah. He preached to those who were Samaritans 
and he preached the word of God outside of the boundaries of Judaism, opening the kingdom of heaven to all the rest of the world. He literally fulfilled the words that Jesus had spoken, and he did so as a reward from God for his acknowledgement of the Lord's divinity and his position as Messiah. He was the promised one. Hallelujah. Whew, Peter really became something else, didn't he? Yes. My God, here he had been the worst student in Jesus' Bible college, and yet he's become one of the greatest figures in the church. His faith was often big at the start, but then it would shrink as life circumstances and situations became more threatening and more intimidating. Had Peter held tightly to his failures and focused solely upon them, he would never have become the keeper of the keys and the opener of the doors to God's kingdom. Hallelujah! In Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, the Apostle Paul writes, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. He said, I don't count myself as holding the prize. But this one thing I do, one thing. How do you deal with failure? This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Hallelujah. And reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. How do you deal with failure? Forget what's behind you. Don't let it, don't let it hold you up. Don't let it stick you. Don't get your feet stuck in the old tar pit, hallelujah, of your failures past. No, let those failures of your past, let them land on the trash heap of history and then move on. Hallelujah. Keep going. Keep marching. Keep following. Keep pursuing the holiness of God, the righteousness of God. Keep living for the Lord. Keep your faith real. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And I'm not worried about trying to stay out of hell. I'm too busy doing all I can to make heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. So today I encourage the saints of God to let go of past failures. Let go of that marriage that failed. And focus today on creating a marriage that works. Let go of past relationships that have failed and learn from your past mistakes how to make your future brighter and more secure. Let go of past investment, bad investments and poor financial moves. There is profit to be made today if you will stop focusing on the fortunes you lost yesterday. Let go of past failed ventures, business attempts. For those of us in ministry, ministry efforts. I told you today the preacher's having to preach to the preacher a little bit. It's hard to hear, even though it's coming out of my own mouth. Let the memories of past failures not live in the reliving of the tale, but rather in the reflection of the lessons learned. Past failures, don't, don't let them live on by repeating over and over again the telling of the story of the failure, but rather reflect upon what you learned from that failure. Hallelujah. Matthew 10, 14, and 15. I'm almost sewing it up today. And whosoever, Jesus said, shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah 
in the day of judgment than for that city. I got news for you today, folks. God is going to judge unbelief far harsher than he'll judge Sodom and Gomorrah. Hallelujah. Some situations this passage teaches us, Lisa, are simply beyond our control. You cannot force a city to accept your message or your ministry. You cannot make someone love you. You cannot force your spouse or partner to suddenly embrace monogamy or faithfulness. Sometimes you have to accept the sad reality of failure. Even when, listen, even when the responsibility for that failure is not yours. Hmm. The Lord said, you go into a city and you preach and they don't receive you or your message. He said, you move on, you shake the dust off of your feet. Shake the dust off you. Now, he's saying, you have no control over whether they believe. You have no control whether or not they accept you or they receive your message. But he said, but when you leave, shake the dust off your feet. What does that mean? He said, leave your failures in the same place that you found them. <laughs> shake the dust off your feet. Leave your failure in the same place where you found it. Glory to God. Don't bring that dust with you because that will just remind you of the town you come from where you were unable to accomplish anything for God. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Woo. Preaching to the preacher. <laughs> Shaking off the dust is symbolic of leaving all memory of that place and the failed efforts at sharing the gospel where you had first picked them up. Glory to God, just leave those failures in the same exact place you found them. Glory to God, how do we handle failure? You forget. You leave those failures behind. You let them reside in history and not in the present. Glory to God. Amen. Failure has no access to a time machine. Oh, I love the Holy Ghost. I love the stuff the Spirit of the Lord will inspire in my spirit. Failure has no access to a time machine. If you leave your failures in your past, let me tell you something. They do not have the ability to get in a machine and find their way into your future. The only way failure can be transported into your present is if you go backwards and dig them up and drag them forward. Hello now. Amen. So if you want to know how to handle failure, leave your failures behind you. Leave them where you found them. Shake the dust off your feet. And move on. Leave them in the past where they belong. Don't carry them with you. Not even the particles of dust that will remind you of them. Forget the experience. But remember the lessons that those experiences may have taught you. Oh my goodness. Let go today of the malfunctioning device. And grab hold of one that works as it should. Why? Because today your very life and your very soul depend on it. Hallelujah. How to handle failure. Forget about it. Hallelujah. Press forward. Move ahead. Keep going. Let those things die. Let them burn on the trash heap of history. Never again, never again to influence or invade your present. Amen. Did you hear from the Lord today? Yes. Would you stand with me today? Glory to God.